Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? Great life. We've got a packed house here at the 1030 service. My name is Trevor. We have new people coming to Community Folk every single week here in person and online. So I want to welcome you. Let me introduce myself to you, to those of you who are new here, maybe with us online. I'm Trevor. I'm one of the pastors here. And we're just so thrilled that you've joined us here today. It's our privilege that you've come to worship with us today here at Community of Hope, and we're glad that you've joined us online, too. Still, the vast majority of our church is online, which is crazy. More and more people are coming back in person, and we still have a ton of people with us online. So praise God for that. Jesus is building his church, and the gates of hell will not stand against it. Amen? Amen. Amen to that. Amen to that. Well, listen, everybody, we uh, we have a great day here in church. For those of you who have become a community of hope for a little bit, you know about this already. But for those of you who are our guests, either online or here in person, we're going to be taking communion today later in service. So if you're here in person, you got those weird little Jesus communion COVID cups. The, so we'll, we'll keep doing that for a little bit. Eventually, we'll figure out when we might transition back to what we used to do and how can we do that in a post-COVID world and all that stuff. But right now, we're still doing those little individual cups. And for those of you who are streaming with us online, if you didn't get the email or if you're new with us here today, go and grab some bread, go and grab some juice, and we invite you to take communion with us online today. Uh, at, towards the end of our message. So uh, today's uh, a moment of just a special day for me here in church, just a moment of personal privilege. I have some guests here today that I'd love for you all to welcome. First off, my mom and dad are back in town. Would you welcome my mom and dad? Yep. And so uh, we have several guests from my home church, the church that I grew up in. So first, I want to introduce Tim and Nancy Harrigan, Paul and Betsy Burroughs. Would you guys stand? Would you welcome them? So these are some of the people, these are some of my best friends growing up. There's, these are their parents, and these are some of the people who helped raise me, and they're part of the greater village that raised me. So if you want to know whose fault it is, it's partially theirs too, okay? So, yeah, still working on it. So make sure you come and say welcome to them this morning. And uh, also, in addition to my mom and dad and the, these two precious couples right here, is uh, my from my home church, my senior pastor who's now retired, him and his wife, uh, Reverend David and Trish Landers, are here this morning. Would you guys stand? Can we honor you? And so um, I affectionately call him Rev. And uh, I just want to honor the both of you. Thank you for being here today. They were here my very first Sunday at Community of Hope seven years ago, and they're here again this morning. I love you. I honor you. I came to faith in your ministry. I came to know Jesus because of your church. Thank you. Thank you. If I say any more, I'm going to embarrass him and I'll cry. So... So welcome to you guys. So it's also a big day for just the Community of Hope family. Again, if you're new with us, we're a multi-site church here in Palm Beach County. And uh, over at our campus in West Palm Beach, our founding and lead pastor, Pastor Dale, he's over there today. Big day in the history of the, the campus over there. We are installing, finally, a campus pastor there today. We have Jose Marrero here on the screen if you're in person. So right about now, Dale, we're just, I'm just going to do this. This wasn't in plan. Right about now, Dale is laying hands on him and praying for him. Let's pray. Lord, we join you and thank you for bringing Jose and his beautiful wife, Giselle, to Community of Hope for the love for you, their love for the gospel, their love for people. Lord, they said that Community of Hope was the answer to their prayers of a bilingual, Bible-believing, loving church. And he's answered to our prayer of somebody who can lead the East Campus over in West Palm Beach. So come, Holy Spirit, upon Jose right now and Giselle and upon their family. And Lord, use him to interest disinterested people in Jesus Christ so that we would all grow together into fully devoted followers of him. Everyone pray this with me. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. That was cool. I didn't plan on that. All right, cool. Awesome. So that's a big day. So that's where Dale is. He'll be back here with us next week. So um, I actually, last weekend, I had the weekend off, which is great. I had a weekend off, which was a lot of fun. It was a good time. And uh, my wife, Leah, and I, we took our kids uh, to go to Hollywood Studios over in Disney World, which is a ton of fun. Anybody here been to Star Wars Land over there? Or the, you know, the edge of the, yeah, whatever they call it. I forget the name of it already. I just sweated it off, all that information in like the hot sun. But here's a picture of me and the kids on Rise of the Resistance, which is super fun. Oh, Yeah. We got in trouble with 200 stormtroopers. It was super rad, super awesome. Now, so here's what I'm telling you. So we had a weekend off. That's right. That's me and my baby's here. Da-da. Yeah. 
Uh, so we, uh, we went on the Rise of the Resistance, and you know, we had a great time. We had the weekend off, and my daughter's still saying hi to me. And, uh, and so the reason I'm telling us is that we had the weekend off, and I asked my kids, Kate and Tessa, I said, well, guys, should we stream church, or do you want to go to church? Like, we want to go to church. We want to go to Kids of Hope, because Kids of Hope is awesome. And so, yep, yep, yep. And so they, uh, we were like, we're going to Kids of Hope. Now, here's the thing I want to tell you. So this actually to the day, seven years ago today is when I moved here with my wife, Leah, when Kate was just one and a half years old to join the team here at Community of Hope. And I remember writing on a bulletin. Remember when we used to have paper in church? Remember that? I wrote on the bulletin in the top right-hand corner, I wrote to, a note to Leah in the middle of the service that I would choose to attend here, let alone serve here. So this is my church too. It's not just where I, it's my job. This is my church. So I wanted to go worship at my church, even if I wasn't preaching. And so we were sitting kind of over there on that side of the room. For those of you online, it's like that side of the room. And uh, we were sitting with some friends, and I was just enjoying church. And Keith and the team did a fantastic job leading worship. And Dale was doing a fantastic job preaching. And he started off, which the message last week was really helpful, really challenging, wasn't it? Great way to conclude mistaken identity. So, um, but Dale previewed our new series called Unity, which we're starting today. And uh, he started to preview, and he told everybody about it. And he was like, we feel like we need to have a conversation about unity. Our country could really use some of this unity. And everybody went, yes, amen, Pastor Dale, you're right. And he's like, and our church could use a good dose of unity. And everyone's like, you're right, just don't make it personal about me. But of course, yes, we absolutely, we absolutely couldn't. Everybody's all bought in on it. And then Dale kind of nervously, nervously and sheepishly was kind of like, so we'll see how it goes. Pray for me, everybody. Pray for, pray for me as I enter into this controversial and difficult topic and situation. Pray for me. And everyone's like, we'll pray for you, Dale. We love you, man. We're going to pray for you. And I was sitting over there on that side of the room. I went, they should be praying for you. They should be praying for me. I'm the one in the schedule next week doing all this. <laughs> if you prayed for Dale, you prayed for the wrong pastor. <laughs> He's like, we're going to preach on unity. Our country needs it. Our church needs it. It's time. It's a little controversial. We'll see how it goes. Go get him, Trev. <laughs> so here we are today, and we're going to jump in to unity. Now, in our church, if you're new, we do a theme verse for each sermon series where it's one thing to learn to be a reader of the Bible, um, whether a paper Bible or on your phone, and uh, that will transform your life in the best way. It's the best habit you could possibly add to your life. Um, but there's another habit that's um, similar but a little different. It's memorizing versus a scripture will do something for your heart, will do something for your soul that just reading alone will do. The Bible talks about it as writing it on the tablet of your heart. And so we're going to try to memorize this verse. It's just one sentence. It's a good one to try it out for the first time. It's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. We're going to put it on the screen. If you're here in person or with us online, I encourage you to read it all together. Ready? Go. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. It's Ephesians 4, 3. So we're talking about unity. Now, can I be honest with you guys? And yet, if you become for all, you know I, I kind of am, for better or for worse. Um, I want to be honest with you here today. I have never preached a sermon on unity before. Now, um, I've preached on forgiveness. I've preached on bitterness. I've preached on reconciliation. I've never preached on Christian unity before. And some of you are like, yeah, I know, you're green, rookie. Of course you haven't. Listen, I've been preaching like 50 sermons a year for a couple years now. Um, and even before I got here, um, I preached for years in different ministries at Florida State where Leah and I met and fell in love with a campus ministry there. I have never preached on unity. In fact, I don't think I've ever heard a sermon on unity before. Have you? Dale and I are certainly like, man, we haven't taught about this. Like, Ever. Reverend Landers, maybe you did, maybe I forgot, I don't know. Just recently. Just recently. Great, okay, cool. Um, I've never heard one before. And if I have heard one, it was probably the equivalent of a Hallmark card, which was like, be nice, because being nice is nice. So be nice. It's like, why can't we be friends, right? Right? Well, a Hallmark card like that healed the division in our culture and in our society. Is that going to cut it? No. Everybody be nice is not going to cut it. And so what we want to do by the help of God's spirit 
is to be able to have a discussion about unity that's more than just a stupid card, but we want to have a conversation about unity that might have intellectual strength to it, that might have a good philosophical undergirding to it, and might be deeply informed by the word of God and by God's word in the Bible. So this is what we're trying to talk about. Now, um, I don't know about you. I had family meetings growing up. Like uh, when my mom and dad, we needed to have discussions about stuff. We would all have a family meeting. We'd sit on our couches here. Now, they're here, so I might be remembering this differently. We sat at the kitchen table when it was real. It was like DEFCON 1, and we were in trouble. It was kitchen table. Family meeting was couch. And we had to talk about issues in our family. And Lee and I do that. Every kids to... Yeah, we do this, don't we? Kids to the couch, we need to have a family meeting. Don't shake your head. You know we do. <laughs> and, you know, we occasionally will have a family meeting about something like that. Now, um, I want to have a family meeting today. So if you are somebody who's navigating faith in Jesus, um, maybe you've never been to church. Maybe it's been forever since you've been to church. Maybe you're not sure. Um, you can be an observer on this today but you're most absolutely welcome, but we're going to have a family meeting with anybody here today, anybody online who self-identifies as a follower of Jesus. We're going to have a family meeting about the topic of you. In fact, that's the title of today's message is family meeting. We're going to have a family meeting. We're going to talk about this. Now, we need unity. Obviously, our country is in desperate need of unity. Um, I read that one author pointed out recently that he said, increasingly, Americans don't like each other. Increasingly, Americans don't like each other. According to a November 2018 Axios poll, 54% 54 of Republicans believe that the Democratic Party is spiteful, while 61% of Democrats believe the Republican Party is racist, bigoted, or sexist. Approximately one-fifth of both Republicans and Democrats consider the opposing party evil. A Pew Research poll in 2016 found both parties largely felt the other was closed-minded and generally unfavorable. How's that go when you have two groups of people both accusing each other of being, the other of being closed-minded? Now, I want to be very clear here. This is not a political sermon series. We here at Community of Hope, we avoid partisan political conversations for the sake of the gospel because the kingdom of God, where Jesus is our king, is above political parties and nationality and atheists. We, believe, we belong to something higher and better than all of that. We believe, belong to something higher and better than all of that. Here's why I'm bringing it up. Because sometimes what's happening, I mean, so like church isn't a building, right? Church is a people. We talk about that all the time here at Community of Hope and online. Like there's more people joining us online today than people who are going to be in actual buildings. So we know the church isn't a building. It's a community. Still, just run with me for a minute with this metaphor. What's happening on the outside of the walls of our community is seeping into our community. And when the Bible talks about when the outside culture is more influencing us than when we're influencing them. You know what that's called in scripture? It's called being worldly. See, what's happening outside here is seeping its way inside here. Uh, the president of a magazine called Christianity Today, it's a magazine that Billy Graham started 60 some odd years ago. The president named Timothy Dalrymple, try to say that three times as fast, um, he writes about the current moment that the evangelical movement finds itself in. Now, just to be clear, um, if you watch a lot of news media, the term evangelical has become a category in partisan politics when it's actually really not that. It's a very broad, global movement that just doesn't exist within America. It's a broad term that exists within Protestant Christianity that has a high view of scripture, high view of evangelism. Um, and we are a part of that movement here at our church. Again, it's not a political thing. It's more of a theological thing, a movement within the Protestant branch of Christianity. Anyway, so he's writing about it. Here's the current moment the evangelical movement finds itself in, especially in America. He writes this. One group within American evangelicalism believes our religious liberties have never been more firmly established, while another that they have never been at greater risk. One group believes racism is still, uh, one group believes racism is still systemic in American society. While another, that systemic racism is just a push and a progressive program to redistribute wealth and power to angry radicals. One is more concerned with the insurrection at the Capitol, and another with the riots that followed the killing of George Floyd. 
One believes the Trump presidency was generationally damaging to Christian witness. Another, that it was enormously beneficial. One believes the former president attempted a coup. Another, that the Democrats stole the election. One believes masks and vaccines are marks of Christian love. Another, that they are the rejection of the same, or that uh, the, the rejection of that same is actually a mark of Christian courage instead. This is the mo- mo- moment the churches like ours find ourselves in. Like, my goodness, I can't remember a time now. I, in the grand scheme of things, I haven't been alive that long. But I can't remember a time in my life when we have covered so many controversial topics in a 14-month span, right? It's been, a, it's been a little bit of a year and a half, hasn't it? It has been. And can I tell you, Pastor Dale and I have felt that. And we've seen that. So what I just read here is a nice quote from a president of a magazine but has absolutely been my experience as a pastor here in our church. All those perspectives exist within our church. All of them and all of that division and all of that is here in our church and in our community. Now here's what I observe and Pastor Dale agrees and we talk about this all the time. We notice things. We notice that generally speaking, people's outrage and disgust for others is on the rise. We observe that people's enemy list is increasing instead of decreasing. And we notice with all the hundreds of cups of coffees we've had with people over the past year and a half with every controversial topic that we've tried to navigate as a church, we've observed that almost universally with every person we've met with about any controversial issue, again, I'm dead serious here, almost universally, everyone believes Dale and I are only listening to people on the other side of the argument. (laughs) Thank you for laughing at that. Thank you. It's ridiculous. I'm sitting there going, what world am I living in? Thank you. That actually makes me feel, that was a cathartic moment, man. Thanks a bunch. Can you be my counselor? Okay, great. Here's the point. Outrage is up, enemy list is up, and people's own feelings of marginalization, where everybody feels marginalized and no one's listening to us anymore. That's what's going on. And you know what? All those are signs and symptoms to me of in our, like a dashboard of the spiritual health of our community and the broader Christian movement in America. It shows me that we're being formed in the wrong direction in some ways, and something's wrong. You see how we're equally offending everybody on some of this stuff? Something's wrong. And so we need to have a family meeting. So our passage for today that we're going to frame this whole conversation in unity about is we're going to pay attention to a moment when Jesus prayed towards the end of his life. It comes from John chapter 17, verses 20 through 26. If you have the COH app, if you haven't opened up your notes yet, go ahead and do that. Um, If you have your Bible, you can follow along here with me or just follow along on the screen. So this is John chapter 17, verses 20 through 26. This is Jesus praying here in the night before he died. He said this, my prayer is not for them alone. And he's with the 12, so he's talking about them. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given to given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Let's pray. Uh, Instead of listening to me pray, I'm going to make a suggestion here. If you're willing, nobody has to do this. There's nothing magic about it. 
But if you're willing, would you just put your palms up on your lap as just a, a posture of openness in prayer? Again, if you're uncomfortable, you think it's weird, don't worry about it. You're not losing heaven points or whatever. Um, but it's just a posture of prayer. And just pray silently to yourself the prayer of the prophet Samuel, which is, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Go ahead and just you pray that silently. Heavenly Father, we're listening. Speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Amen. So this passage that we just read is the final night before Jesus' death. Nearly one quarter of the entire book of John is the content of this one final night and meal that Jesus had with his disciples. John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Five chapters. It's almost 25% of the whole Gospel of John. Of the four Gospels, the ancient biographies of the life of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John is the oldest and was written last. It's almost like the Apostle John, late in his life, saw Matthew's copy, Mark's copy, Luke's copy, and thought, those are all great. They missed a lot of what happened on that final night, and it needs to be written down. A quarter of the Gospel is one night's conversation. Powerful. The night is filled with high tension and high drama. Have you ever been with somebody right before they knew they were going to die? This is what's happening in this passage. Jesus, it's the last night before he's about to be betrayed and crucified. And so it's getting real. And it cuts through all the junk where he begins to say real things. He washes the disciples' feet. He teaches on how to be intimate with God and how to abide with the Father. He teaches on the person and work of the coming Holy Spirit. What would happen over the next three days? And then he prays for himself. He prays for the 12. And then he prays for everybody who would come to believe in his message through them. He prays for you and for me. And his prayer is amazing. It probably confused the disciples. He prayed this. May they be one. That they may be one. He prays for unity. He prays for unity. Now, what's interesting, if this is the night before you're about to die, if you, like, you have a moment to pray with your friends, final prayers, you're setting up your movement for all time, and what do you want to pray to the Heavenly Father to answer for you for what's about to happen, is this what you think you would have prayed for? Do you think this is what the 12 thought he should be praying? Like, were they giving side eyes to each other? Like, he's asking for that? Like, part of me wonders if they thought that Jesus should have been praying for things like, Father, would you please overthrow the Roman Empire and liberate Israel from occupation from Rome? All of them would have been given a sounding amen to that. Jesus could have prayed some like spiteful prayer like, Lord, overthrow Caiaphas. He was the high priest at the time who was totally corrupt and led to Jesus' execution. Overthrow Caiaphas and show him that he's a big jerk in your name. Um, he could have prayed for the 12. I mean, maybe maybe pray, you know, when he was praying for all of them, maybe some of them wished, Jesus, would you just pray a little bit more that Peter would quit having foot and mouth syndrome? Can you quit praying for them? Can you quit praying for Matthew to be so tight with the money? Can you da 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 um, maybe, and if Jesus is going to pray for all the people who are about to follow him and for all the people who are going to come to faith through the message of the 12, if he's trying to set up the movement for success, again, notice what he's saying, that the world would believe that you sent me, that the world would believe that Jesus is the son of God, what would you have prayed? I think the vast majority of us would have prayed something like this. Father, would you let those who believe in their message be able to do lots of miracles, so pour out power, then the world will know. Or our Father, pour out growth and blessing and momentum that they would just grow like crazy and then the world would know. Or protect them from all persecution that nothing ever bad would happen from because nothing ever bad happens to them. Then the world would know that you are the Son of God and that everyone would believe. And Jesus prays for none of that. And Jesus prays a maddening and confusing prayer. Make them one. And then the world will believe that I am your son. Mind-blowing. It's confusing to us, and I would 
bet my lunch. <laughs> Do you see how I thought about that carefully? <laughs> I would bet my lunch that uh, the disciples found it confusing too because everybody misunderstands unity and we misunderstand unity in today's culture in huge ways. We misunderstand unity to be things that it's not. Like our culture, and honestly, I think most of us think unity first begins with total agreement. Unity is total agreement. Now, if you've ever been married, you know that's not true. Okay? Um, but honestly, our culture thinks this way. Unity is totally agreement. Do you, ever hear this, do you ever hear that one about the guy named John who saved somebody who was about to jump off a bridge? You ever heard that one before? Let me tell you about it. So there was a guy named John who once saw a man on a bridge and he was about to jump. And John said, don't do it. God loves you. Do you believe in God? And the man said, yes. And John went, oh, me too. Are you a Christian or are you a Jew or are you a Muslim? And the man said, Christian. And John went, oh, me too. Are you Protestant or Catholic? And the man said, Protestant. And John said, oh, me too. What denomination? And the man said, Baptist. Oh, John said, me too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? And the man said, Northern Baptist. And John said, oh, me too. Northern Baptist or Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist. And the man said, Northern Conservative Baptist. And John went, oh, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes region or Northern Conservative Baptist Eastern region. And the man said, Great Lakes region. And John said, oh, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879 or Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region's Council of 1912. And the man said, Council of 1912. And John said, you heretic, and pushed him off the bridge. <laughs> See, I mean, like, it's funny, but like, we actually kind of do this a little bit. Like, we, in our culture, Christian or not, we think unity means total agreement. Like unity is total, total agreement is the holy grail. And if we agree on everything, that means all division will be eliminated and we'll have utopia. Oh. And so what we have to do is just be in total agreement. Is that reality? No, it's not. And so when you realize you can't have total agreement on everything, where does that go to next? Well, this goes to where we cancel each other. Now, this has been a lot in the news lately about cancel culture and all this other stuff. And can I just be real for a minute? Is cancel culture a real thing that we should deal with? Yeah, but let me tell you, I know lots of people who are, like, I'm not saying, like, anybody in this room, just speaking generally. I know lots of people who could be in this room or online who aren't in charge of any media company, but we will totally cancel somebody we don't like. Can I just say that? Can I just step on some toes? Can I say that? Okay, some people are like, I can't believe he's doing this. Oh, my gosh where we cancel other people. If you don't know what that means, that's where we just try to silence people because we don't like their disagreement with what we believe. And what we do when we try to cancel people, we try to silence people, you know what that is? That's actually the spirit of murder without the blood because you actually don't want somebody to exist. Now, here's the only problem with canceling people. If you cancel them or silence them or silence their opinion about something that you don't have agreement on, do they go away? No. They're still there. And so if total agreement doesn't work and then canceling doesn't work, well, then what you're left to do is you're just left to hate people. And our culture is rife with hate, filled with hate and enemy making, and it's on the rise in our culture and in our church. And so we hate each other. I mean, here's the problem again. This is a family talk. So this is for everybody who self-identifies as a follower of Jesus. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you're off the hook on this one, even though I would strongly recommend it's better for you to follow in the ways of Jesus. If you're a Jesus follower, let me say it clearly so you can hear me in the back. If you follow Jesus, you're not allowed to have enemies. If you follow Jesus, you're not allowed to hate anybody. Because Jesus says, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Maybe the people we're most angry at in our culture, we should just spend more time praying for them instead of being angry at them because it's hard to be angry at somebody you're praying for. 
and then all this dumps into it. If you can't have total agreement, you try to cancel people, we hate people, then it just lives into a culture where we're like living in conflict all the time. They were just swimming in all the time and name calling and all this stuff. I mean, this is why social media has, in a lot of ways, has turned into like to a cesspool of people just yelling at each other all the time. I got off Facebook for the first quarter of the year just as, a, as an experiment. My mental health got better because I didn't listen to people who start yelling all the time. I deleted Twitter from my phone because all it is people screaming and yelling at each other. And we just live in conflict all the time. That doesn't work either because as the ancient wise philosopher Dr. Phil used to say, <laughs> he used to say this, how's that working for you? How's, how, how's, how's all of that working for us? Is it? It's not. It's not. And what I'm here to tell you today is not to beat everybody up about our anger. I'm here to tell you Jesus has a better way. In fact, Jesus taught on this. We said, may they be one. May they be one. What does that mean? Well, here's actually what unity means in Scripture. If we throw all the misunderstanding away, here's what unity actually means. Unity is oneness of heart, mind, and action. It's oneness of heart, mind, action. It's not total agreement, but this oneness is like people coming together in a unifying way instead of moving away from each other in a disunifying way. Here's some of the scriptures that help inform some of this. What's the scriptural testimony of this idea? Jeremiah 32, 39 says this, and this is the Lord speaking through the prophet. He says, I will give them singleness of heart and action so they will always fear me and that all will go well for them and for their children and after them. 2 Chronicles 30, verse 12 says this, Also in Judah, the hand of God was on the people to give them unity of mind, to carry out what the king and his officials had ordered, following the word of the Lord. Acts 4, verse 32. In verse 31, there's another outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that God pours out his Holy Spirit multiple times, not just one time? Crazy. So in Acts, God pours out his Holy Spirit in verse 31, and here's the result of it in verse 32. All the believers were one. In heart and mind, no one claimed any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything that they had. Here's the interesting thing and the amazing thing about all of this that gives me hope. I remember growing up, my mom and dad, when my brother and I would be fighting, dad would come in and go, knock it off, just get along. You know, we'd just do all the bickering stuff. Everybody bickered with their siblings growing up. If you're an only child, sorry, this is leaving you out. And it was just knock it off. And I feel like a lot of times when we think about unity, we're probably think God's just coming in, kicking in the door, going, everybody knock it off and get along. And we can't pull it off. According to these scriptures here, it's God who brings the unity. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that heals communities. It's the spirit of Jesus that's at work in mending relationships and keeping people strong together. I don't have strength in myself, and neither do you to be unified. But the God we worship here in this place and in this church is the God of unity. He's the one who sent his son to die so that we could be unified with the Father once again. And he's the one who died on the cross and sent his Holy Spirit so we could be unified with each other once again. It's actually the whole message of Jesus is oneness with God and with each other. It gives me hope that it's not all up to us, but if we cry out to God, he can do it. Now, here's the other thing that Jesus said, that they may be one, but notice the second phrase, as we are one. Now, who's we? Is he talking about him and the 12 disciples, the 12 goobers around the table? Is he talking about them? No. He's talking about what's called the Trinity in Christian theology. Now, the word Trinity is actually nowhere in the Bible, but the concept of the Trinity is all over the Bible, especially in John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. It's all over the place where Jesus very clearly paints a picture of who God is, that God is a perfectly unified being of one, There's only one God, but within that Godhead are three distinct persons. And Jesus says prayer, his prayer, he's begging the Father, make them one like we're one. It's the whole reference point for everything. And that's what he's answering. He's God, Father, give them 
what we have. Now, the problem is followers of Jesus get really confused around this idea of Trinity because we think it's some mathematical equation and we try to pretend like we're mathematicians and scientists when we're really not. And we're trying to understand how can three be one and uh, it doesn't make sense. Don't think of the Trinity that way. It's not a math equation. Think of the Trinity as a table with three friends around it having a cup of coffee. I want to show you a picture. This is an ancient icon called the Icon of the Holy Trinity. It was painted by a man named Andrei Rublev in 1425. It's considered one of the great, he was considered one of the greatest painters of Russian Orthodox icons. And this was based on Genesis 18, the story of Abraham and Sarah and God visiting them. But also Christians have interpreted this passage, and so did Rublev, of it's a perfect picture of the Trinity. And so he painted an icon to help depict it. And this is like pre-Renaissance, pre-Leonardo, Michelangelo, and all this stuff. So the art level isn't the same, but just roll with me here for a minute. And by the way, if you think icons are weird, I get you. It's not like I have a bunch of icons hanging up in my house. Like Joanna Gaines is not hanging up icons in people's houses in Waco, Texas. You know what I mean? Like it's not very chic. Um, here's something I do to help people understand. Here's a picture we took a couple years ago, some guys to just help it out a little bit more. Does it make it better? Does it make it better? No, no, okay, okay. All right, so go, go and put up the icon again. Put up the icon again. But you get my point. Just roll with me here for a minute. So here's what's the beauty in this picture. Uh, scholar Steve Seaman says this, that when people reflect on this picture of unity in the Trinity, notice this, each person is holding a staff, meaning they possess equality of divine authority. They all wear blue robes pointing to their oneness, yet they also have different colors of garments indicating they have distinctive identity, yet they are still one. Apparently, unity is not conformity. Notice that their faces are bent towards each other, disclose humble, self-effacing love for one another. They have gleaming eyes which convey enjoyment of each other. See, this is a perfect picture of intimate friendship and relationship and community, which we're partial to here at Community of Hope, because what's the second half of the word community? It's unity. It's unity. And this is Jesus' final prayer for the 12 and for all of us, that we would experience perfect oneness, perfect friendship, perfect relationship, I mean, don't, haven't you ever experienced just a season of perfect friendship with somebody before either of your brokenness ruined it? Isn't there nothing better than that? And that's what Jesus is praying, is that his followers would be one, as the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are one in complete unity. And Jesus says, that will win the world to believe in me. I want to ask you, what does it feel like when you think about unanswered prayers that you're carrying with you? I think of some of my most painful unanswered prayers. I think of uh, when Lee and I were at Florida State, there was a, a pastor that we knew of whose daughter was in our ministry. He had four children. And his wife, he and his wife were both relatively young, and she all of a sudden overnight became septic out of nowhere. And we literally prayed all through the night, all night long, that she would be healed and God would spare her life. And she died in the morning. Gut-wrenching. Uh, Lee and I had a, a friendship that was some of our best friends in the whole world um, long before we came here. And we, like, we were in each other's weddings. We were going to do life together and raise our kids together. And then we had a conflict that broke our friendship, which seems and feels like irreparably. And it is still divided a decade later. And I've been begging God to reconcile it and heal it, and it's just gone unanswered. And it hurts. 
Other people I've prayed for who are far from God and I'm asking God to soften their hearts to the gospel, the message of Jesus, to remove them from harmful influences, to introduce them to good influences. I've done everything, I've prayed everything, and they're still far from God. And it hurts. You know how people feel when we have unanswered prayer? We grieve it. And I'm here to tell you today, this prayer of Jesus is the great unanswered prayer of Jesus. So when if you're struggling with unanswered prayer in your life, you're in good company because Jesus knows how you feel. He has asked his father for all time to make his followers one. And we're not. And it grieves him. Ephesians 4.30 says this. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Just on a personal note here, you know what's the most convicting thing about preaching this message here? It's all of us. Is that as the band is coming up, I want everybody to still be locked in. Don't get distracted. The most convicting thing I feel in this message for me personally is that this was Jesus' final prayer before he went to the cross for his followers, for me and for you. It was obviously we thought was most important. It was eminent. Uh, He couldn't have prioritized it anymore. And I have not cared as much as him about unity. I haven't even given it more than 10 seconds thought in my journey as a Christ follower. And I've prioritized my judgmentalism, my quick to judgment, my slander, my arrogance of feeling superior to other Christians and other followers of Jesus and being divisive and, and be, um, slandering and gossiping and all this stuff. When Jesus' prayer was, if they would just be one, the whole world would believe in me. And I haven't cared as much as I should. And neither have we. I think that's God's word for us today. Is that I only want you to know one thing. Is that unity really matters to Jesus. And I only want you to do one thing. I want us to begin by just confessing that Jesus, we've blown it. And we're sorry. See, there's no guilt trip here today. Nobody came to church to go, well, you should care more about it now. Go home and live different and just try harder. That's not the gospel of Jesus. There is grace here in this room. The spirit of Jesus, which can heal communities and bring unity and heal our divisions is here in this room today. But to access that grace and that life-changing power of him, what has to happen is us acknowledging our shortcomings and our fallings and our failings and saying, Jesus, we've blown it. We need you. You are our only hope.